I get it. Crapping on interns is a national pastime. It's American it's baseball and apple pie. Okay, we all crap on interns. In this episode of Bourbon and Breaches, T-Mobile discloses a data breach, SolarWinds executives blame interns for leaking password, and Qualys got broken into? Qualys, the company that penetration tests everyone. Welcome to Bourbon and Data Breaches, where we cover the five most interesting data breaches from the last week and one of our favorite bourbons. I'm Steve. I am Sue. Howdy. I'm Nikki. Okay, great. Well, Nikki, it's been an interesting week. What do you have for us today? First topic we'll be covering today, T-Mobile discloses data breach after SIM swapping attacks. Uh, this is the fifth data breach in four years. And as of now, there is an undisclosed number of SIM swap attacks. Uh, things are not looking good for these T-Mobile customers. You guys have mentioned it plenty of times on this show. Uh, what do you think about this most recent breach? Uh, so I use T-Mobile. <laughs> so you're breached once again. I am breached once again. Fool me 12 times, shame on you. <laughs> Um, I'm scared. I mean, it's horrible. Uh, it's concerning whenever there's uh, anything that could even threaten SIM swapping because it's uh, incredibly damaging. And there's a lot of really dumb companies out there that still use uh, SMS for multi-factor. Please don't use SMS for multi-factor. It's been proven time and time again to not be uh, effective. Uh, you can do SIM swapping, and there much, there's much more safe, secure ways of doing multi-factor. Um, I, I always opt for uh, an, a TOPT token or a Google Authenticator, <clears throat> Authenticator token um, because it's, it's one of the most secure ways of, of doing it. How long have you been with T-Mobile? Uh, a few years now. Long enough yes. to be... Four breaches five. worth. <laughs> yeah, four, four breaches worth. That's how long. Four breaches worth. Um, if anyone doesn't know what, sw sw what SIM swapping is, uh, it basically hijacks your phone number and you should do some research as to what uh, the consequences are because it's pretty darn scary. Um, most banks these days use, uh, use uh, two-factor authentication via text. And so if you don't get, if uh, someone has stolen your phone number, uh, you don't have access to those texts from your bank anymore when they say, hey, you're trying to log in from here. So this is a very bad thing. And uh, we raised this issue at an earlier bourbon breaches when uh, there was a, it was disclosed that there was another attack in December. Uh, this is a separate attack. So yeah, not good when mobile providers get uh, data leaked out into the world. The uh, SIM swapping's got a very interesting history. Um, if you're not a ransomware gang, it has very recently been shown that SIM swapping is one of the most profitable ways uh, of committing cybercrime, especially as a solo practitioner. Um, and uh, Vice had a really good uh, special on it where they covered kids that were getting into SIM swapping because uh, it doesn't take very much technical expertise. It takes basically just calling into a uh, phone bank and um, doing some social engineering. Um, but they were doing it to uh, get access to um, short Twitter handles. They're using it to take over phone numbers of people that owned uh, three character Twitter ha handles. And they did it for just like the bragging rights. Um, but then they found they could make tens of millions of dollars each year by doing it as well, so. That's something that I think most people really just don't take into consideration because if a bank is going to be leveraging a lot of my faith and security in terms of like, hey, this is with your phone, you decide your password, or you use your fingerprint, or you use whatever to, to access your money that you can see through this app that we provide you. And that's all just kind of uh, easily bypassed. That's scary. I think that's the scary takeaway. Uh, <clears throat> if you think if you think that's scary, look up uh, SSL bypass if you're using a public Wi-Fi. 
ne That's never do point. banking on public Wi-Fi because there's way more scary things that can happen. Look, look at, uh, no, it's SSL intercept. Look at SSL intercept, which happens all the time. And, and a lot of companies do it too, that they will uh, stop your SSL traffic at their router, decrypt it, and then re-encrypt it, uh, and then pass it along. Set up a wire guard server on a Raspberry Pi at home and do everything with that. But if you're on a corporate Wi-Fi, you don't always have that control. You are very screwed. Yes, that's mm -hmm. true. Don't do, yeah, to... <clears throat> don't do personal banking on corporate Wi-Fi or networks. Don't do anything on Wi-Fi's you don't own. That's I think true. that's the takeaway here. <laughs> Moving on to topic number two. SolarWinds executives blame intern for leaking password SolarWinds123, leading to the largest security breach in the U.S. Your company's name with 123 is not the best approach, but I'm going to guess that it happens more often than not. Have you guys run across this? What's your thoughts on, uh, on this whole story? I have opinions on this. Go ahead, sure. <laughs> I seriously, yeah, this has been, we, we talked about this when Solar Ones came out. Uh, I seriously doubt, at that time, I seriously doubt that that was the attack vector. I still seriously doubt it's, it's a leak password issue. Um, there may have been one, this may have just been one of many possible uh, attack vectors. And even if it was, look, I get it. Crapping on interns is a national pastime. It's American it's baseball and apple pie, okay? We all crap on interns. I feel like politicians and execs are just focusing on the default password issue because it's easy for people to understand. So I agree with everything Shu said. Um, one, that's a silly password. Don't, don't have silly passwords. Um, <clears throat> two, uh, an intern should have access to this amount of data, nothing. Yes. An intern should not have access to anything. Th the level of uh, infiltration that, that the Russian hackers, and I believe we can now say that they're Russian, um, the Russian hackers uh, got into SolarWinds was enough to change distributed binaries of one of their most popular products that then infected 16,000 other companies, some, some ungodly number. Um, no intern has that level of access. So uh, yeah, could an intern be a step along the way that let a hacker in? Sure, um, but interns shouldn't be setting their own passwords. Um, and interns should be completely walled off and siloed. Uh, I think the bigger issue is um, there was some way for a hacker either through the intern's account, which I hope is not true because that would be silly. Don't give interns access to distributed binaries um, and, and code signing and all, all the other things that would be required for this. Or uh, the hacker move laterally uh, within the network which again, should not happen. Like, how, how does that even happen? What system does an intern have access to that allows a hacker to move laterally? Like, I would be happy to take on an intern here at, at Hack Notice, um, but we would give them very small permissions and we would allow them to do very few things. Um, and, and even then, like, we would watch them like a hawk right? Because we're, we're in the security business, right? We, we, we don't just, and so is SolarWinds. I mean, come on. SolarWinds is in the security business, whether they like it or not, because they're in the DevOps business. That's, that's all about security. Um, so I, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I believe much more that uh, Russian hackers exploited some system-wide issues that SolarWinds had in order to make this happen. Uh, yeah, it's easy to blame an intern, but in the end of the day, they're not supposed to be doing anything but learning. Why give them any access to anything? I think it's time for a bourbon break. Bourbon break. 
Uh, great. Today we have a very special bourbon break. Um, we have Bib and Tucker. We've got their six year and both Shu and I have it. You have the six year, right, Shu? I do have the six year. Uh, Shu has never tried this. So I'm breaking the seal for the first time on camera. Let's get Shu's unvarnished opinions, um, and then I'll go a little bit into the background of who Bib and Tucker is. Okay. Little surprise, it's some it's a company you know, but you may not have thought you've heard of before. All right, here we go. It doesn't smell like regular bourbon. Huh, interesting, okay. Huh, that's interesting. I don't know what I get from that. I definitely get booze. Um, I would not get the same off-putting plasticky taste that I got from uh, Old Forester. Um, huh. Yeah, I can't like, s s like s say I taste honey, caramel and all that regular BS. Um, tastes a little bit like glue. So I also have Bib and Tucker six year. Um, my general review before we get into the background is I like it. It it, it does it does not have a strong burn, so I will give it that. It is, it's pretty smooth. It's it's nice. It's sweet. It's light. Uh, it's not a heavy it, bourbon. You know, it's, it's very light. Yes, very light color, light straw color. It's ninety two proof, which is not that strong. Um, uh, you know, corn, maybe a tiny bit of spice on it. Uh, not a very long lingering finish. I enjoy it. It's a nice bourbon to have in the background. It's generally fine. It's fine. Um, interesting story though. So let me share a little bit about Bib and Tucker. The thing about Bib and Tucker is it's a very pretty bottle, right? And in fact, you can tell this this is their website. It's all about the bottle. Um, one thing I noticed from Bib and Tucker, not bottled and bombed. So that means they did not distill it. That means someone else distilled it. Uh, now, Bib and Tucker has won some awards. The six year is a San Francisco World Spirits Competition silver winner. And their 10 year is a double gold winner. So we have the six year, the silver winner today. Um, you know, I really like this because it was a gift, right? So gifts always taste better. Looking into Bib and Tucker though, that's a brand for the D Deutsch family. Deutsch. Do Deutsch. You, you can't even say it's Deutsch. Did do do duetch the duetch family wine and spirits so that was danish i don't know weird you know weird name but they are known for yellowtail oh in fact they are a very well known wine producer uh yellowtail and josh sellers so right. These are two very well identified brands. Does Yellowtail um, like the six dollar bottle of wine at the gas station? Nice. Yellowtail is you when you think of that Australian wine. Yep. That's the Touche Winery. Um, so uh, went on to our friends over at uh, Breaking Bourbon. Um, by the way, Breaking Bourbon, if you ever want to collaborate, let us know. Uh, and so. It is sourced bourbon, thus the no bottle and bond. It's rumored to be Dickel. So we all know Dickel. Dickel is, uh, I've actually never had it, probably other than a well bourbon. Um, yeah. 
a very well known brand, but you know, so uh, they have lots of stuff in here, but basically it's Dickel and we've got their mash bill. Um, interesting notes here. Um, so the reviewer focuses a lot on the MSRP. The MSRP was uh, $55. Shu paid over 60. Um, I paid over $60 and thank you, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington. Yes. What is interesting is that uh, I'm enjoying this. It's nice, it's fine, it's a gift, that's great. Uh, but when you enter the realm of $55 bourbons, you are up against Blanton's, E.H. Taylor. Uh, you're up against like two bottles of Michters. So you're, you're in a very specific class of, of bourbon. And this particular reviewer noted that it's a pretty bottle, very good presentation, not the most exciting bourbon. Um, and I, I do have to agree, um, you know, nothing against uh, these wines. I actually like Josh Sellers. It's a perfectly fine wine. Also, there's no tasting room for Bib and Tucker. The only thing I could find was the Douche Family Wine and Spirits uh, corporate office in um, Stamford, Connecticut. Um, so if you're interested in having a tasting of Biv and Tucker, my best advice is just to go to their corporate office and say you'd like a tour. This Say Hack notice sent you um, and let us know how that goes. Uh, according to the pictures here, they'll give you a nice tote bag with Yellowtail. Um, and maybe they'll do the same thing for the bourbon. Long story short, I, uh, I enjoy the Bib and Tucker. It is uh, an enjoyable bourbon. Um, if you can get it as a gift and not have to pay for it, that is the preferred way of getting it. Right. It's not terrible. I mean, I've had worse bourbons, but um, when you're putting it into the class of, say, blends, which is my favorite bourbon in the world, I would literally sell my soul to Bland's. Um, this, I'm gonna go with Bland's. Uh, okay, great bourbon break. Uh, let's get back to the breaches. Okay, so special breach that happened today. And I'm presenting it instead of Nikki because uh, it happened in the dark net, right? So if you see here today, Klopp Ransomware claimed, most likely truthfully claimed that they uh, broke into and ransomed Qualys. Qualys is a company well known for uh, penetration testing and um, vulnerability scanning everyone. Um, so it's incredibly concerning if Qualys gets broken into. Uh, I'm going into the dark net here. So, you know, anyone that's never been, it's not that exciting. <laughs> here's, here's the Klopp uh, ransomware disclosure page. We've got Qualist, we've got their NASDAQ symbol, SMP, some details. Uh, what else do we have? Um, looks like we have some DocuSigned contracts. So that's uh, some proof there, uh, some Qualys scan results for various companies. I'm gonna go with uh, some companies in Japan, um, invoices, other things from Klopp. So uh, if you're using Hack Notice, you receive this uh, in your uh, system today. If you're not using Hack Notice, uh, you can easily sign up for hacknotice.com. And you can see all the other disclosures from Klopp as well. Um, Klopp, this is the most recent disclosure. Um, the little known ransomware, not really um, in the news a lot, but clearly with Qualys uh, reaching into some pretty big companies. What do you guys think? Uh, since you put it in our company Slack to add it to today's episode for us to film, I'm looking just 
my regular uh, perusing on Google and just seeing the top hits on news, it's been covered more than five times in the last like four hours. So <laughs> and you saw it and you noticed it. I mean, like some of the latest ones were 24 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. So uh, it does go to show that when you have your your uh, your hand in the hacker darknet cookie jar, you tend to come out with a little bit more information uh, on the top end, at least. We we got this directly from Klopp, um, and we noticed it way before any media. Uh, I I pushed it out to all of our subscribers and also um, some people that, that are looking for specifically this type of uh, activity um, around publicly traded companies. Um, and a uh, side note, uh, Qualys has gone down close to 6% today. I don't know if it's related because media hasn't been picking this up. So evidently they found out about it 30 minutes ago. We found out hours ago with the, this morning, um, uh, long before anyone else. Um, and. Yeah, this is this is what you do if if you pay attention to the dark net, if you monitor ransomware gangs as they're disclosing, you can get the jump on all of these activities. Yeah, very little has been uh, published on what has happened because it's been so fast. Um, but yeah, I have nothing to add about this <laughs> except. Steve woke me up about this, and I would not be surprised if it drops even further on, uh, after market for trading, trading tonight. What, what is interesting is that um, several hours before Klopp announced it, their stock was down two points. And now their stock is down close to seven points, right? So some people are paying close attention. Um, and some people may also have had uh, knowledge ahead of time. Um, you know, hackers have been found to short stocks ahead of uh, an announcement like this. Um, hackers are all about maximizing their return. H hackers are, are completely capitalists at heart. They want to maximize their return on a hack. And um, I would not be surprised if someone six degrees away from the original hacker um, shorted this stock before the announcement. Topic number four comes from ZDNet. Headline reads, Oxford University Lab with COVID-19 research links targeted by hackers. Um, this is not new. We've been covering all, plenty of stories over the past six months about COVID research, hackers trying to get to it either by state actors or by people just playing a goof. Um, but what stood out in this article was the fact that much like the hack that happened with the Florida water treatment system, uh, this line reads, the lab's biochemical preparation machines, with quotes, were compromised by the unknown attackers uh, who boasted of their break-in to what appears to be lab equipment, pumps, and pressure tools in, a, in an attempt to sell access to their victim systems. And that seems like a lot coming from a prestigious university that has a lot of research that does much for the entire world. Um, am I freaking out about nothing here or what are you guys thinking about uh, this, this hack? So um, I don't think that anyone should be surprised and, and does feel like we've talked about this many, many times. Um, and I was trying to kind of, uh, I was trying to think of, of, of where specifically we talked about this before. And the only thing I, I can think of is that we had talked about kind of in general, there were warnings from say the NSA and the, um, the governments of the Western world that, the, that, they, that these universities were, and, and, and pharmaceutical companies were being targeted nothing was very specific and it feels like that this is first off the very the, this was the first instance of a specific case that an organization was targeted yeah we we've previously talked about how hackers and i believe those specifically russian hackers were targeting covid supply chain 
um, and whether or not they're going after trade secrets or how to develop the, you know, Sputnik vaccine better, um, or just to cause general chaos, which seems to be what a lot of these uh, state sponsored groups want to do. Uh, we, we don't know what, what their um, motives are, but it is interesting that this particular group um, was selling access. And that, that's become a pretty popular way of monetizing uh, a breach is, uh, let's say you break into a company, you successfully break in, um, and, and maybe you're doing this automatically. Uh, you're using some automated software. Um, you could go about like installing ransomware, like doing like, you know, horizontal uh, moving around within the environment, you know, privilege escalate, uh, escalation, or you could just sell access, right? Because that's like, that's a lot of hard work. Um, if you go about like completing the hack, you could just break in and then sell it to somebody else that, that wants access to that group. And, and it looks like that's exactly what's going on here. We see it often with banks where it's like, hey, I broke into such and such bank. I'm selling access for like 5K, right? Um, if you know how to monetize that better than 5K, then buy access from me. And it seems like it's the same thing here. I don't know what I would do if I had access to a university's lab for COVID, but um, obviously the hacker, you know, dark market is uh, thriving and they can sell access and someone somewhere wants access and they will do uh, whatever they want to do. Um, so, you know, it, it just goes to show that even if you don't think you're a target, a hacker could break in because uh, you happen to have the wrong vulnerability at the wrong time. And then they could sell that information to someone who does want to break in to you. So, Moving on to topic number five. Our last topic of the day uh, comes from The Verge. Headline reads, Gab blames reported hack of 40 million posts on demon hackers. So there was a comment early on. Um, the, the TV show Supernatural had 15 seasons. And I don't think they ever covered demon hackers. <laughs> um, or as came up in the news a few months ago, demon STDs. Um, so someone was blaming COVID on a de it being a demon STD. Um, and and I, I just find the uh, imagination of these groups to be um, incredibly uh, funny and endearing because they're blaming uh, their lack of security uh, on demon hackers. So hackers from the underworld. Um, I don't, how does it even work? It goes back to one commit that the CTO of Gab did. And what he did was strip out the uh, SQL injection filter of, uh, of a certain commit. And they were, hackers were able to get into the database based on, based on that one commit. So there's a, there's this illusion of openness with, with open sourcing your code and yeah maybe that's true but you still need to know what you're doing and um yeah that apparently was the entryway into their whole database you know what they should have done is you pour a no, ring of no, salt no. all around the data center <laughs> and they can't get in just a salt ring would have solved this problem this has been an episode of bourbon and breaches if you liked what you saw today uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, if you have bourbons or breaches you'd like us to cover, you can contact us at contact at hacknotice.com. Until next time.